Welcome to State of Mind. It's amazing to have you all here. Um, before we get into a little bit about these two amazing people sat next to me, I always start this podcast in the same way, which is asking my guests, what is the last thing you did that positively impacted your health? So Richie, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah. Um, this morning I went to a Primal Fit class. Has in Primal Fit is the most fun thing if anyone hasn't tried it before. Uh, it kind of combines animal movement and like gymnastics and maybe a bit of yoga with some calisthenics. It's basically just rolling around on the floor looking crazy, but it is the best exercise. So I, I did that this morning. It's basically all I do these days. Um, and uh, oh, I had a cold shower before I came here. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. We're going to talk about that later. I think we will. Yeah, it was very relevant. <laughs> and Debbie, what, what would your answer be? Yeah, so I... Um, just got back a couple of weeks ago from a yoga retreat. So I went to Mexico by myself and it was something that I started doing about five years ago. I went off by myself somewhere to do something, which um, is a bit of a challenge when you run your own practice and have family and children and things to organize. But I really felt just such a lot of benefit from going somewhere different, taking a different perspective, because I think we can all just become so micro in our worlds that just mm. getting out and seeing a different scene was was really, really amazing. And I think that for me, because my work is just so cognitive and cerebral, I can just become a sort of giant brain yeah, on legs. For sure. So to go away for a week and do some movement is, yeah, it's great for me. Really good. Amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you guys um, and what you do. Um, Debbie, you're a functional medicine practitioner. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, great question, Grace. So my, my actually my primary training was actually in nutritional medicine. So I did a master's in nutritional medicine and, and started working quite quickly after I graduated. But what I realized quite quickly was that some of the complexity of the type of people that were coming to see me, I actually really needed to have a much better understanding of the biochemistry. So I then went on and, and trained with the Institute for Functional Medicine. And what we're really looking at in that is helping us understand and also talking to our patients about actually the, the interest intricacies and, and details of how the body works. So I'm very much um, interested when people come to see me about the biochemistry, and that's very much a kind of systems biology approach. So that's, I suppose, the slightly different bit from just being a nutritionist. So does that mean that you would, for example, um, do lots of testing for people and do like, oh, I'm going to run a hormone profile or I'm going to do a stool test or that kind of thing? Yeah, so I, I do run a fair amount of what we call functional labs um, in my clinic, including sort of stool analysis and hormone testing and some of the more kind of complex panels. But I actually always start with some of the basics that I know we're going to we're going to talk about. But yes, it does allow me to start to interpret data that otherwise we might not have at our hands to understand the complexity sometimes of, of people's health. Amazing. And Richie, you're a breathwork uh, instructor, coach, practitioner, whatever you like to call it. Um, what's your journey been to to becoming that? To teaching breathwork, yeah. I mean, there's there's not a university degree to uh, to teach people how to breathe. Um, I came across breathwork uh, really by accident, actually. So I have uh, an accounting degree. Um, I used to work I in management. I did not know that. Yeah, I have an accounting degree. Um, I used to work in management consulting. I worked in one of those big consulting firms for six years. Um, but how I came across breath work was uh, to help my dad. So my dad years ago was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And uh, to be able to help him, I started researching what are some things that we can do. And we were looking at nutrition. We were looking at mindset and all these different things. Um, and then I came across this guy on a podcast, actually. Uh, his name is Wim Hof, and he's uh, or known as the Iceman. He's this crazy Dutch guy, and he has 20-something world records all related to cold exposure. And so uh, the reason why I was interested in him, and he was talking about his, this technique he created where it involves breathing, it involves taking a cold shower or doing an ice bath, so exposing your body to cold temperatures, um, and how it seems to be great for everyone's health and well-being, but specifically really good for people who have autoimmune issues. So that's how I came across it. Uh, my dad, he's an old school Brit, right? And I went to him and I was like, hey, mate, so... Uh, this Dutch guy called the Iceman says that if you do some <laughs> breathing and take a cold shower, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help your MS. What do you think? 
Uh, and uh, it was actually over a Skype call and he just promptly closed the window and I didn't hear from him for two weeks now. But um, it, uh, it took a little while to convince him. In fact, it actually took me doing my own little reconnaissance mission and going to Poland to spend a week learning this method. So we were in Poland in the middle of the winter and we were doing all the crazy stuff that he does. We were swimming in ice lakes. We were hiking around uh, in the snow barefoot just um, in our shorts. It's like minus six degrees out. Um, for like an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, we climbed the tallest mountain in Poland just wearing our shorts again, minus 19 degrees. Takes like four hours to get to the top. So doing all this crazy stuff, but what really struck me was the breath work and uh, what can happen just by breathing in certain ways. It's kind of long story short, dad does his breathing every day, um, cold showers every day, changed his diet as well, which is very, very important. And this is actually perfect timing because literally this morning, uh, I got a text from my mom saying that he, uh, they just had his uh, semi, sorry, biannual MRI scan on his nervous system and zero progression in any lesions or anything like that. Um, it hasn't changed in years. That's so amazing. it's really, really, really incredible. But that's how I got into it originally. And then I just kind of went down the rabbit hole of learning from anybody who was doing something interesting with breathing. Incredible. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity to talk about autoimmune conditions. Um, it's a phrase that I think a lot of people here might have heard of, um, but perhaps don't really know what it means. Or you hear scary things like, oh, it's your immune system attacking itself. And like, you know, um, can be quite scary. And then treatment, perhaps in a functional way for an autoimmune condition could be very different to a more conventional way where you might be looking at steroids or something like that. Debbie, can you take us through what uh, an autoimmune condition actually is and what's happening in our bodies and, and why, for example, Richie's dad is experiencing such benefits from working with his uh, nervous system. Yeah, sure, Grace. So um, I work with predominantly sort of women in, and children in my clinic and autoimmune conditions make up a really, really big part of that. And as, as you probably know, um, particularly for some of the more um, serious, although they're all serious autoimmune conditions, things like lupus, which is a kind of multi-systemic autoimmune condition. Women far outweigh men, actually, in, in many of these conditions, and I do see a lot of them. I mean, essentially what's happening is um, the immune system is creating a tag, which is essentially an antibody, which it's then tagging, and that could be a piece of tissue or an enzyme or a protein in the body, and marking that as something that needs to be kind of broken down or destroyed or attacked by the immune system. Now, that can happen with any part of body tissue in the body, but people often heard of things like, um, you know, MS and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's and thyroid conditions. And traditionally, the treatment for that has been some type of suppressant of the immune system function. So normally and most commonly, it would be some type of steroid medication along with um, a painkiller because some of these conditions can be intensely painful and people have very significant chronic pain that can go on for years and managing that is is not particularly successful I suppose I would say in terms of the people that I see it really is a case of managing symptoms the the different way that I look at it in clinic I often use this analogy of a boiling pot so if you imagine that the boiling water is the autoimmune condition that's happening in the body and essentially using something like a steroid is literally just putting the lid on it so we can't see it anymore but if we understand that all these autoimmune conditions are basically a driver of the immune system underneath, what we also understand is that some of these autoimmune conditions that are seen as separate are actually intimately connected. They all have similar drivers, but they're just located in different bits of the body. So what I would be doing with somebody who came into clinic is trying to understand what those drivers actually are for them. Where does that start? And I always start off, first of all, with the gut, because we now are understanding that actually the majority of our immune system is actually here located in our digestive tract. So we always start at that, and we understand that there's likely to be some level of, of kind of dysbiosis or intestinal permeability where the immune system's changing. And then we're looking for triggers, so something that has upregulated to the immune system. And this is where it can be very individual. And my job is a little bit like a detective working out what that can be. And those triggers, and I think this is possibly one reason why it's so prolific in women, can be stress. 
Um, it can be toxins, it could be pollutants, it could be for many women postpartum after having a baby, um, it could be you know, multiple exposures to viruses. And that's a very, very individual thing for each person. So my job as well as addressing the immunological system of the gut is to try and understand what some of these triggers are. Mm. Um, What's interesting about that in terms of our conversation tonight is when I actually take time and listen to people's stories about what's happened to them, most people have got a pretty good idea what that trigger might be. Mm. You know, they, they have a moment when they can say to themselves, I was okay until that happened. Um, and when we're looking in terms of our own health, looking and spending time to look at our own triggers and what have happened to us often gives a really good indication of some of those things that we need to fix. Amazing. And with, um, in terms of kind of the stress response and, and the nervous system and what's happening um, on that level, working with, presumably working with breath work Richie helps because you can kind of tap into that more restful state where you can kind of take yourself out of that stress zone and presumably you know you, when you're in that stress state the healing that you would need on a functional level just isn't going to happen yeah and it's actually really interesting because it kind of goes both ways so you can use your breath to put you into a state of stress or to take you out of it um, but as it relates to autoimmune stuff it's actually about creating acute moments of stress. Mm. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think. So you're, tra you're kind of training your immune system in that sense. What you're actually doing is by breathing in certain ways. Um, so if we talk for specifically about Wim Hof method, for example, um, it's a very stimulating breath. It's fast, it's deep, um, there's breath holding involved as well, uh, and then you do cold showers as well. What this is actually doing is this is creating mild stress responses in your body, uh, which increases, just for a short period of time, um, levels of adrenaline in your blood. And what has been shown is that actually these acute spikes of adrenaline help to suppress the immune response, actually help to suppress the uh, certain inflammatory cytokines that rise up as part of this immune response, and that seems to be our, to be honest, our best guess as to why it seems to be so effective. Mm. It's, uh, it's not, a I mean, chronic stress obviously is, you know, something that is going to break down the body in its slow way. But in the same way that we go to the gym to, to build up our muscles or to get stronger or fitter, acute moments of stress are actually fantastic for the body. Um, as long as you are able to come out the other side and go into your states of relaxation, and that's actually where breath also can be very useful. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there because that's the issue, isn't it? That we, um, so many of us can't come out the other side these days. We're walking around with chronic levels of stress. I mean, you probably see this all the time in, in clinic, Debbie, and it's really hindering um, people's healing processes and just their quality of life in, in general. I often say that people don't know what it feels like to be relaxed anymore. Yeah. Uh, we live in oh, such a fast-paced world with so much stimulation, so much stuff coming in all the time that, you know, we're always kind of slightly activated, whether it's notifications or any of the screens that we are surrounded with. Um, you know, it, the world is actually always vying for our attention. Uh, so it's not really designed Modern society isn't really designed to be relaxing anymore, unfortunately. It wants you to do this or to buy that. Um, so, so uh, yeah, be, being able to choose where you are, you know, do you want to be in your relaxation mode? Do you want to be slightly activated? Because that's good as well, you know, to be able to have um, the body ready to do something. Um, and that's where, you know, breathing is so, so useful. But I think when I work with people, quite often they come out of it going, huh, I thought like if I was to ever get this relaxed, I would be falling asleep. Mm -hmm. But actually I'm quite awake. But for some reason I feel completely chilled out. It's this interesting thing that people have completely forgotten that actually this resting relaxation mode is there for you, but we're constantly stuck in this fight, flight or freeze, if you want to call it, uh, response. So training your nervous system to be able to come back to the other end and experience that for a little while uh, is super useful. Yeah, and, and Debbie, can you, in terms of like the systems that are uh, at play in our bodies when like Rich was saying, we're in this fight or flight response, is everything working optimally at that time? I mean, what kind of, what would we be looking at in terms of being chronically stressed and the impact that that has on our health? Yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, certainly before I started understanding and getting more context about what happens in our bodies. Stress is just such a sort of 
big word, is it? Mm. Like, what do we mean by stress? It's, and it's also such an easy word to bandy around these yeah. days. Like, and it's almost like it's a kind of prize. Like, oh, how is your day at work? Oh, I'm so stressed. Yeah. I, you know, I just can't. I'm just so stressed. It's like, it's not a goal. <laughs> no. It's not a... It's, no. And I, and I think that also part of that is when we... Um, understand what what stress is from a, a biochemical perspective suddenly we start to get more idea about what we can do about it so you know particularly when we're talking about stress what we're normally um, having a conversation about is this kind of autonomic nervous system and autonomic just means automatic it's just something that your body does without you actually having to do anything which is brilliant because if we had to think of anything it would go badly wrong. So this autonomic nervous system has basically got two parts and you've got the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And most people have probably heard those terms. It's a little more complex than that, but that's, that's kind of where it is. And so um, the sympathetic nervous system is really, you know, what Richie was talking about in terms of this fight flight type response. And that's happening because we're actually producing these hormones, cortisol and adrenaline that are coming out of our adrenal glands that are sat up here on our kidneys. And these hormones actually have really very specific actions on the body and what you I mean you all have experienced these but when we have uh, in this sympathetic state our heart's going to beat a little bit faster our lungs are going to open so we can take in a bit more oxygen our blood flow moves away from our digestive tract comes down to our hands and feet so we can run away and we can skate really quickly the other thing that happens is we also really mobilize glucose into our bloodstream so that the body can can run if we need to, that there's literally going to be energy there. And that's something that often I talk to people about that will actually have problems with weight loss, you know, no matter what they're eating. If they're constantly producing cortisol that's actually driving glucose into their bloodstream, then they're going to be putting on weight no matter what they eat. And when we start to understand some of these mechanisms, we can start to put some of these pieces together. Now, the exact opposite of that is the parasympathetic nervous system and everything happens in reverse. So blood flow comes back to our digestive tract, our heart rate slows, our breathing slows and it's much deeper. And interestingly, our, our immune system actually gets into a state where it's more involved with repair than it is involved with, research, with actually searching. So that can make a real difference for people, particularly with autoimmune conditions. And, and what's important about that is understanding that the regulation of these two systems is actually managed by something called the vagus nerve and vagus actually in latin means wandering so this wandering nerve has got as many nerve endings in it as the spinal cord but most of us probably never heard of it and this wandering nerve actually starts in the brain goes down through the voice box into the lungs, then into the digestive tract and down to the kidneys and does all this without us thinking about it. And the really great thing, particularly about breath work and often you know, things like pranayama in meditation that's been practicing for some time, lots of breath work actually causes pressure or what we call toning on this vagus nerve and actually can help us move in between this parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous state. So it's one of those things that lots of these breathing practices and traditional meditation practices have known for a very, very long time without understanding the science mm. of it. Um, but science loves to sort of label stuff that's obvious. And, yeah. and that's really, I think, helpful in terms of understanding a little bit about what Richie's saying about how that can actually create this shift. And it's literally because of the, the way that, that part of the vagus nerve that controls that actually moves through the body. Does exposure to cold, asking for a friend, um, I'm really big into, into cold swimming. Yeah. Um, I remember reading or hearing something about, you know, uh, getting like brain freeze, for example, is the fastest way to hit your vagus nerve. I don't know whether that's true. I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> but if anyone's dunked their head into a bucket of ice, it feels interesting for a while. But when you take your head out, you feel fantastic. You feel fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah you feel so, so I would great. believe it, but yeah, I'm not yeah. entirely sure, I actually. I mean, there's something, um, when I looked into sort of traditional vagal toning exercises, certainly things that create a gasp. And right. for some people, not necessarily like dunking your head in a bucket, <laughs> but, you know, like cold water that creates a gasp, actually yeah. because it's creating pressure on the vagus nerve. Sorry, oh God, that's the so vagus nerve and how it's struggling down can make a difference. And I think that often when you hear about people saying, I splash some cold water on my face, yeah, yeah. you know, just to bring myself around, I think it may well be have some origins in, in the, the vagus nerve. Yeah, I mean, and you, you're right, it's totally not for everyone, but that is 
the first thing that all of my like cold water swimming community do when we get in is like, oh my God, it's so cold. But you yeah. feel fantastic. And Richie, do you cold shower every morning or? Yeah, every morning. Yeah. Um, it took a little while to get there, but eventually when you work out that each time you come out, you're definitely going to be alive and actually feel amazing, then it mm. kind of makes it worthwhile. But you know, getting in the habit of cold showers, especially when it's cold and dark, like now, uh, is, is a bit tricky. Yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to actually start with cold showers, the best thing to do is to start warm. So go into your morning shower, have wash, whatever you do. And then for the last 15 seconds, turn it cold and just do your best. And then maybe you can increase it, increase it. But the trick with the cold shower is to not try and resist it. Don't try and, uh, like have a timer and be like 20, 19, 18, <laughs> 17. That's actually not the point. In fact, the time is almost irrelevant. Um, it's all, you know, really a form of mind-body training. I mean, there are so many physiological benefits uh, to the cold, but for me, it's, it's the mind-body training that is the most interesting part. It's teaching the mind to be able to relax when your body is in a stress response and start to create that groove, start to create that connection. So when you're sitting in your, standing in your, your cold shower, sure, you're going to, the water's going to hit you and you're going <gasps> to freeze up. Mm. How quickly can you relax? So how quickly can you <sighs> let go of a shoulder and then let go of another shoulder and relax your belly that has completely sucked in and relax it, become a jellyfish under the water and then slow your breathing and start to breathe lower and using your diaphragm rather than up here using these accessory breathing muscles. That's the trick. Once you have that under control, and if you do that in 20 seconds, then you're done. That's, that's, that's the training. So don't wait out a cold shower. Relax. Mm. That's the point. And then you can take that feeling into your everyday life when you're feeling stressed you have those tools to kind of get back to that well state. that's it how how great is that you're already priming your nervous system to go even in a stress response because let's face it we don't think to become stressed do we we just live life and all of a sudden we just go oh actually i'm feeling stressed for some reason stuff's happening so in the in the throes of your your daily life you already have trained your nervous system to go okay my body goes into stress but my mind's okay yeah. And that cuts the loop of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking. That means that you can come out of this stress response quicker, hopefully. And there's lots of other things you can do as well. But. Amazing. So, I mean, like cold showers might not be for everyone, but <laughs> we've presented quite a strong case that exposure to certainly moderately stressful situations like being in cold is a really good way of um, ultimately positively impacting your health. And that's something that you can all do on a daily basis. Debbie, in terms of other practices and skills that we can kind of give people to um, just to kind of tune in and to take that control and to take that responsibility, um, what would be some kind of key um, practices or whether it's like nutrition hacks, um, lifestyle hacks that you would give for that? Yeah, so um, I'm. there are kind of three things that I work with as my baseline in clinic for people that, that come to see me. And the purpose of this is really so that people can become a bit more expert on how their body's working. And the first one of that is some type of 10 minute practice, no matter what that might be. It could be something like some breath work for people. It could be walking outside on the grass for somebody else. It could be some yoga, but at least 10 minutes every single day of some type of practice that helps you move into that parasympathetic state. Um, breath work is just a really powerful way of doing that, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. And there are other ways because we are mm. all many people with many different bodies. So 10 minutes practice is, is the first thing that I start with. Um, the second thing that I always really encourage people to do and something that's simple to do without a practitioner is to do some type of elimination diet. So people often come and they say, oh, I'm not sure if this food's okay for me and I'm not sure if that food isn't and I might be having a problem yeah, with it. Yeah, because this. we're all allergic to everything these days. <laughs> yeah, or we've done like an online test. Online like, I can't test. eat eggs anymore. Or somebody, somebody told me that I mustn't eat this because yeah. it's going to do this to me. And we are all very individual and very different. And part of this um, podcast, which I was just so excited to talk about, Grace, is 
I really want people to become experts on their how their body is working. And you can do that very simply through a very simple elimination diet. What I normally recommend that people do is a 30-day trial and they take out, they can start with something as simple as gluten and dairy. They're actually the biggest triggers that I see for people's health commonly in clinic. And I usually start with that. Um, if people are not following vegetarian diets or they might have things like autoimmune conditions or pain, I might look at taking out beans and grains, which if you can do that for 30 days and, and they aren't your protein sources, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, again, can be super helpful. And just see how you get on. You need to do it really consistently for 30 days to actually see some type of proper effect from that because that's how long it actually takes for these antibodies in the body to actually decline. Mm. And then add it back in again and see how you go. Mm. Just that one simple thing will give you some really good information about how your body's functioning. And it sounds, everybody will have tried it a bit, but not tried it, but not done it completely. And oh yeah, I did have that bread. That doesn't work. You have to do it completely, 100% everything out. And then you will get an idea of how that works. So I always suggest elimination diet is a really simple place to start. You can get great stuff on the internet. There's good books on how to talk you through it and introduce the foods. The other thing that I talk to people about, independent of what their diet choice might be, is actually maintaining their blood sugar levels. So something that really has an impact on most people's well-being, including their gut function, their stress levels, their hormone levels, losing weight, um, is actually managing their blood sugar. And that's because we don't have a proper understanding of how insulin happens in our body. And for many of us, the carbohydrate-based breakfast that we have can have a really significant impact on our blood sugar throughout the day. So even if we're going for something like granola and fruit and yogurt, healthy breakfast, these are really, once they get into your bloodstreams, carbohydrates. So what I, I super high in sugar, super high yeah. in sugar, like it's glucose when yeah. it hits your cells. The body also, um, for some people's bodies are not particularly insulin sensitive first thing in the morning. And that's got a bit of a relationship to do with cortisol and how that gets up. So what can happen is these blood glucose levels can rise. Then eventually our pancreas wakes up, produces some insulin that acts like a key into the lock and our blood glucose levels drop. And that is happening if you get to the office about 10, 30, 11, and all you want is cake right or, or another coffee or another coffee or something else to keep you awake so that mm. if that's happening to you that is your blood sugar dropping to quite a significant level so one thing people can do and again I say try this literally for a week like seven days is all I ask people to do and that's to have some type of protein along with their breakfast so that could be eggs it could be wild salmon it could be sardines for those people that eat meat could be a good quality bacon sausage um, for those who don't something like a dal or kitchery or homemade beans along with some veggies and I say try that for seven days and just see how your body manages it and actually just that can have a really significant impact on our stress levels our cortisol how we've managed the day and our mood so those are my kind of three um, principles that I like to work with irrespective of what diet choice people make around amazing that. I'm such a big fan of the Debbie Lewis protein, protein based breakfast, breakfast. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, and Richie what tools would you give people whether it's like a breathe out for longer than you breathe in or that kind of thing. You read my mind. That's crazy. <laughs> um, I'll, maybe I'll give you a couple because we'll, we'll touch on that. But since you mentioned it, I feel like I have to give something else as well. <laughs> um, you know, learning breathing techniques uh, can is, is so, so useful. It's it, it can be used throughout the day. You can do it before you go to bed. You can do it as soon as you wake up. It can be for three minutes. It could be for 30 minutes. It could be for three hours. You know, breath work is very, very diverse, and there's lots and lots of different ways to be able to use it. Um, but even beyond manipulating your breath in certain ways, simple breath awareness can be transformational. And what I mean by that is actually just seeding in your mind that becoming aware of your breath is kind of important throughout the day. It doesn't mean constantly thinking about your breath, but can you start to just notice what your breathing is doing? You know, um, eventually, if you start to get good at it, you start to actually notice your breath changing before changes in your state occur. So for example, if I do feel stressed or something hits me before I notice that I'm stressed, usually I'll notice my breathing changing. 
It takes a bit of time to develop, but that by itself um, can tell you so much about your state of being. It's like the, uh, the thermometer for what's happening in your body throughout the day. So maybe just set an alarm, uh, not that you need any more notifications, but maybe just start with that until it gets into a habit of um, just becoming aware of your breath every now and again, whether you're sitting at your desk, whether you're walking down the street or in the tube, um, just notice what's happening with your breathing um, and see if that tells you something because there's, uh, there's so many messages in the breath. Everyone's breath is as unique as your fingerprint. Everyone breathes differently. And then in different situations, people's breathing will react differently. Um, part of the training that you do in certain types of breath work is actually to read people's breathing to actually see what's going on with them at that time, especially in a therapeutic setting. So can you see a depressive breath? Can you see an anxious breath? Can you see uh, a breath that's grieving? Sounds kind of weird and esoteric, but actually it's really interesting to see. So just becoming aware and see if it has information for you. And, and okay, extend your exhale. So we we're talking about the vagus nerve before, and uh, studies have shown that by uh, elongating and extending your exhale to be longer than your inhale has a very stimulating effect on this vagus nerve. So very, very simply breathe in and out through the nose. Uh, you can breathe in for let's say three seconds, maybe four seconds, and then on the exhale, double it. So six seconds or eight seconds. It's the most simple thing to do. Um, but one thing I will say, and this is something that actually gets lost in a lot of breathing techniques, is that volume of breath is also really important. So I can easily say, okay, this is a relaxing breath, four seconds in, eight seconds out, and then someone's gonna go, fill up their lungs completely, everything gets tense, everything gets full and expanded, and on the exhale, they'll And because it's a really long exhale, and they don't quite have a good diaphragmatic control, then they breathe out all the air in their lungs. So actually what you're doing is you're creating a lot of muscular tension, which actually will have the opposite effect of relaxation. It's actually gonna stress you out even more. Um, there's also an element of balancing the gases in your blood as well, and when you exhale,